everybody. Welcome here. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. Everyone's excited today. I hope you're excited at home uh, because we are so, so grateful that you have invited us into your homes today, tonight, whenever. Um, I don't know how your day has been or how your week has been, but I just want to encourage you, for those of us here, for those of you at home, to just release whatever negativity, whatever drama, stress you've had, and just be ready to praise the Lord today with a joyful heart. Uh, Psalm 100 says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. I just want to invite you to stand with us. Um, as we sing this first song. Let's praise the Lord.
the gap Lord you gave us life again you shed your blood on the cross and you made us complete because of it God and I pray Lord that uh, we would continually and daily take our cross of God and follow you that we would put aside 
all of our selfishness and everything inside of us that would just stop us from following you, God, that we would put those aside and focus on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith, God. We just pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ben, for leading us in worship. Right on. Well, hello. Welcome to New Hope Church. We're glad that you are here. Those of you in person and our online community, we're glad that you're here. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Last week, Pastor Jay preached the best sermon I've ever heard on loneliness, friendship, and the genius of Jesus' life group strategy. And I was reminded during that sermon of T.D. Jakes, who says that there are four kinds of friends. There are commanders. They are there for the resources that you or your church can provide for them to help them arrive at their destination. Then there are comrades. Comrades are against the things that you're against, whether it's lockdowns or progressive theology. And then there are constituents. They are there for what you are there for. For us at New Hope, that is to see lost sons and daughters come home to the Father. And lastly, there are confidants. Confidants, they are there for you for your whole life long. One of my confidants said, my calling in life is to support your ministry. Kind of like war buddies. So which of these are you and to who? And what's your relationship with New Hope Church? If you are not a believer... Welcome to our community. I know that there is some helpful takeaway for you every week. If being comrades together, being against progressive theology or being against lockdowns has brought us together, can we take the next step towards being what Jake's called constituents? On mission together to see lost sons and daughters come home to the Father. And lastly, are you a confidant to anyone? You will be blessed to have one or two confidants in your life. People who are for you to the end of your life. Now you know that friends have to put up with a lot of baloney. In you. Just ask my friends and they'll tell you about me. Friends get to disciple each other and friends get to be on mission together. I have some pretty amazing friends and they gave me permission to tell some of these stories. We've been through thick and thin together, we've been on mission together, like. War buddies. My friend Jeff was my, is my oldest friend. We don't quite agree on the details on this, but he stole my girlfriend. <laughs> I was out on a grade 11 trip in, in BC with Bev Entz, who I had no idea at the time would become one of my best friends. But that was okay, because months and months later, while well, Jeff was out in BC, I stole his girlfriend, and I'm married to her today. <laughs> Jeff taught me how to drive a car. We formed Grant the Mennonite Brethren Church's first worship band. We never made it on stage, <laughs> but we had high hopes for songwriting. Jeff's dad took me to Nipissing fishing with all the other Mennonite dads and sons, and he adopted me into that that whole thing. My second oldest friend is Art. Art and I formed our relationship, our friendship, doing street evangelism every Tuesday night on St. Paul Street in St. Catharines. 
Tuesdays, we would stop people on the street, and we would tell them, ask them a question, if you're going to die tonight, are you going to go to heaven or go to hell? And the, the ones that didn't tell us to go, <laughs> we would lead them to Christ. And then on Thursday night, we'd gather them together for a Bible study. And then on Sunday, we'd pray them into church with blue jeans and, tea and tube tops down to the front. And some of them live with us for a season. Some of them stole from us. Some of them work for us. And later, we would plant two churches together. While PJ was preaching, did I mention that that was the best sermon I've ever heard on loneliness and friendship and the genius of Jesus life group strategy? I heard that sermon three times, and I kept thinking of my friendships, because we have been on a quest that we could have never imagined. It's been riddled with tragedy, sometimes of our own making, sometimes not. This quest has been incredible with heights we could have never imagined and lows so low, you just don't want to take another step. At one time, Jeff and Art and I were all out of work at the same time, wondering how we were going to feed our families. And in that, we decided to plant New Hope Church. <laughs> you see, we are not golf buddies or fishing friends or car friends. It's deeper than that. Some of my friendships are new. Some of them go back 40 years. But when we die, people will not talk about our friendship, primarily about the ways that we played together. We do play together. But more profoundly, like army buddies who are still in combat, we serve together. Veterans who go off and do a three-year hitch end up having a lifelong bond. Well, friends on mission together, doing a 40-year hitch so far, and still going, have a much deeper bond. My friends have been there for me in my times of crisis. I'll never forget for months, Art would tell me, get up and preach, get off the mat, Tom. You've been knocked down, you've been betrayed, kicked and abandoned and left for dead. But just get up and preach. Every Wednesday, preach in my garage, preach in a barn, just get up and preach. And I'll never forget driving through Jordan Hollow in the back seat of the car. Jeff and Bonnie were in the front and Jeff told me that we should plant a new church and I could count on him for $10,000 a year in tithe to get the church started. Not long after this, and we're not clear on the facts, but it was something like Bonnie was like, I'm so hurt from our last church experience, and now Je Jeff's pledging $10,000 that we don't even have. <laughs> so Jeff. We sunk our severance and our tithe and our work and planted a New Hope Church. I remember Julie Horrocks being there from the beginning and a number of others. The one thing I want you to take away from this talk today is that Christians run toward trouble, not away. The church is not a referral agency. We are the place where people go to for help. During Y2K, when all the computers were going to stop, we held a crusade at the hockey arena with 3,000 people doing an outreach. And now during COVID, as early and as safely as we could, we've opened the doors for church. We have ministered to 26,000 people since the beginning of COVID through these doors. Well, you don't know how many died yet, let me tell you. Barely one or two cases were contracted at New Hope, maybe that many. Zero have led to hospitalization or death. See, the church is not a referral agency. We are the place that you go to for help. Like first responders, we at New Hope Church are trained every month at our leaders' pub in 911 crisis prevention and recovery. 
You can look up our training video on our YouTube channel. You'll see the 911 training video and our seven steps one there. Some friends will leave you when the crisis hits and may come back when things settle down. But Christians run into trouble and stay. If you stay friends long enough, you will have a crisis or two. Like scouring Niagara for Glenn's wife's body who was missing. Later than identifying her body so he didn't have to. Navigating a nanny who turned wife, Kimberly. And oh baby, we have had some wild times in the midst of all that. One friend got lost for 10 years and got into colossal crisis in the 90s. I'll never forget the day that my friend Bonnie called the house. Jeff had been arrested for theft and I needed to go down to the police station. Friends run toward trouble. On the way there, I figured he'd started this online business, car business with some guys who were probably doing some shady things, and he probably got charged due to his association with them. I wish. In the police station, he told me that the first part of the 911 crisis that he'd created, he walked into a bank wearing a mask with an unloaded pellet gun and robbed them. And he got away. But the fake license plate that he put on his car was hanging askew, and the police pulled him over. That was on a Monday. 24 hours earlier, on Sunday, I preached that you need to come forward this Sunday and write down your sin and put it in this makeshift coffin I had created in front of the church and be done with your sin once and for all. You see, there was a recession in the early 90s. Jeff was selling luxury cars, and luxury cars weren't selling. But bills still needed to be paid. Instead of telling Bonnie, instead of telling his life group, and instead of downsizing, well, that Sunday morning, Jeff wrote his sin on the piece of paper and came forward and put it in the coffin. And the next day, he held up another bank. When the police asked permission, for permission to search his car, Jeff knew that this was the answer to his prayer the day before. He didn't have to give them permission. He knew that if he did, they would find the mask and the gun and the money, and it would be over. And if he didn't, they couldn't search his car, and he would be free to sin again. In the police station, Jeff asked me what he should do. Should he confess everything to the police that he had done? They wanted a written confession. They wanted a video confession. And I asked him, did you do it? And he said, yes. And I said, well, then confess it in every way you possibly can. Because you see, I'm a Christian. And I know that the Bible says Confess your sins one to another so that you might be healed, James 5.16 says. Jeff was my oldest friend. This was not the first time he needed a friend to come alongside him. I told him, confess, because I feared for his soul. And he did, not just to robbing that bank, but seven others. Sunday, Jeff asked God to help him stop sinning. Monday, he got the opportunity to let himself be found out. And he took it. And Monday night, he sealed the deal in writing and on video. And that was the day that healing began. Friends, Christians run towards trouble. Like first responders at the World Trade Center on 911. And that's why we get training 
Every month at Leaders Pub in dealing with 911 crisis, we have that training video. I hope you will watch it. And then we practice this every week at Life Group. We run towards trouble. We don't refer people away. And when 911 happens in your world, we have training and a plan to help you. And better yet, we can prevent 911s with our plan and our training. Well, Jeff got out on bail and he needed a place to live. And he lived with our family for eight months. My colleague from another church in town took me aside. He said, Tom, that is so unprofessional. Having a bank robber live in your home, what are you thinking? Yep, I agreed. I just never signed up to be a professional pastor. He was my friend. And while there's no DNA relationships, my kids call him uncle. He needs to be surrounded by Christians now more than ever. And soon he'll be surrounded only by criminals. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says, if one member suffers, we all suffer. Of course there are boundaries. Wisdom calls for that. And everyone else put their boundaries in place. Fair enough. But God told Elaine and I to invite our friend to live with our family. Our children grew up having all kinds of people live in our home. As we together as a family were on mission. Jeff wasn't the first, and he certainly wouldn't be the last. So first things first, buddy, I don't think you're a Christian. The problems you've had in the past and now these in no way represents what it's like to be a Christian. And so I gave him an assignment. Go away for three days to Mount Carmel and Niagara Falls and pray and find out if you even are a Christian. Because of that fact, that reality will determine everything we do from here on in. Jeff's conclusion was, yes, I'm a Christian. But I am one seriously messed up Christian. And I didn't argue. Okay. Step one, done. Now it's time to call the life group. It's time to call a counselor and lawyers and confess to the church. It's time to put the 911 plan in place and to do the seven steps. Funny thing is, this happened at the same three-month period just before my ordination when I had an elder who was charged and convicted and in jail for sexual abuse that happened 17 years earlier, long before I had ever met him. As well as a counselor that we had on contract who'd been praying for women on his lap. <laughs> Lawyers and crown attorneys don't like it when pastors tell people to confess. Defense lawyers want to put in a not, not guilty plea. And crown attorneys hate confessions that are done under pressure from a church. It might be a confession thrown out. I had many enemies in those days. PJ said last week, nice people don't get nailed to the cross. I didn't know I wasn't being nice. I was concerned for a family who needed a dad to come clean before the Lord. Last week, Pastor Jay said, the trajectory of love is truth. Paul says in Ephesians 4.15, to speak the truth in love. But it doesn't make you popular. But dear, dear people, are already being destroyed by sin and lies and deception. Truth, Jesus, the truth, can set them free and break the stronghold of darkness. It isn't fun having lawyers mad at you, but it gets worse. My friend was a really, and is, a really nice guy. People like him. Sold exotic cars. 
Lots of rich, rich Christians liked him and wanted to help. And so they took a collection to pay back every dime that was stolen from the banks in order to help get a reduced sentence. He knew about that. And just before they gave him the money, they thought, we should call his pastor and see if he's okay with that. And I told them, no. Don't give him the money. Matthew 6, 24 says, you can't serve God and money. You'll either love one and hate the other. That Jesus' greatest competition for your affection is your money. Money is what got my friend into this problem. We don't need money to get him out of the problem. We need Jesus to get him out of the problem. If he was going to get a lighter sentence, it was going to be from Jesus and not from money. And they agreed. Well, I got to tell you, that night I was terrified. I guess it's kind of weird now. But at the time, I had no idea who my friend was anymore. No one thought he'd be capable of robbing banks. And I was afraid. When he finds out today that I've taken away the get out of jail early card, oh, it's totally unfair to my friend Jeff, who was not a violent man. But I was gripped in fear that night. I paced the floor all night long, praying for the safety of my family. Well, it turned out that he really meant what he prayed. And he agreed to trust Jesus to save him and not money. There was no way we could have known at the time that that lighter sentence that he would have received with the money, he got anyways but directly from trusting Jesus. Like first responders at 911 situations, Christians run into trouble. Not to rescue people, but to connect them with Jesus, the rescuer. We know about the incredible dysfunction of being an enabler. We are not about enabling sin. Rather, we're about enabling grace. We will pick you up for an AA meeting. We will go with you to the lawyer or to the mediator. We will help you in your crisis. We will not rescue you, but we will walk with you to faith and trust in Jesus. Walking toward trouble and through the trouble means that you need to be there. Testifying in court, having Bonnie and the girls over many Thursday nights for dinner, weeping together, discerning together, navigating together, visits in jail in Thorold, in Millhaven, at Joyceville, Pittsburgh, and after that, reconciling with spouse and kids and family and church, and the long, long road of rebuilding trust. Matthew, Jesus said in Matthew 21, 5, in Matthew 25, I was in prison and you visited me. In that season, I had three church members inside all at the same time. Now, I know that some of you are having a real rough go in life in your family, in your marriage. You've lost hope, and you're wanting to give up. Well, Thanksgiving marks 25 years to the day that Jeff went to jail. And today, Jeff and Bonnie have a great marriage. They have great relationships with their children. They have a great relationship with their church. Bonnie's a trustee. Jeff and Bonnie are elders in our church. They serve in the worship team and in life groups. Even one of their girls just led you in worship. <laughs> Bonnie's a professional counselor at Hotel Du Shaver. And they are launching an awesome new auto magazine that you really should buy. Shameless plug for my friend. <laughs> but most importantly, you should take them out for coffee and ask them to give you hope. 
Friends, you need to surround yourself with people who can encourage you and give you new hope to reconcile with your spouse, with your kids, with Jesus and his church. That is the abundant life. Don't surround yourself with people who will commiserate with you and agree with your decision to disobey the Lord. Surround yourself with people who've walked the road and got through it and can give you hope. The Voss family can offer you hope and empathize with whatever 911 crisis you find yourself in. I grew up singing the chorus, what a friend we have in Jesus. You need to know that you have one friend who is totally for you and will never leave or forsake you. When I get really down, hit with a down day, I reach out to my friends. I call them up. Ah, busy signal. I call up the next friend. Ah, busy signal. I call up the next friend. Ah, busy signal. Every time I hear the busy signal, I hear Jesus' voice getting a little louder and a little clearer. Hey, Tom, I'm right here. I'm right here. I'm always your constant, forever, instantly available friend. Just turn to me. And then I do. And I smile at how dumb I am. And he hugs me. And we talk. And he'll talk to you too. My friends and I are still on the quest. We aren't done. In fact, the best is yet to come. We're going to keep going until we are out. Out of time, out of strength, out of money, out of energy. And when these old heaps of skin and bone finally give up, in an instant, in a twinkling of an eye, We will be changed and clothed with glorious new bodies and stand before our Savior ready. Ready to rest a while. Ready to marvel and worship, praise and give thanksgiving to our Lord Jesus. And then ready. Ready for the next adventure that he calls us to in serving him for eternity. Friends, you want in? You want to join us? You want in on the quest? Well, we're going to go. We're going to go right now. And we're going to start by going to Life Group. Enjoy this. So my name is Kara, and I've been coming to New Hope for about a year now. Well, funny story, actually. So first time I came to New Hope was the Life Group (laughs) sign-up. And I just went and signed up for a life group. (laughs) For me personally, I tend to thrive a bit more in a small group setting. Uh, So on church, I love church, but I find it hard to kind of connect with everybody just in with every everything that goes on. So I knew a life group was was kind of more my style, if you would say. So I just wanted the community and just people who kind of had similar values to be able to do life with. Yeah, the experience was awesome because, well, the first couple times it took me a little bit to get used to it just because, you know, it's new people. Hi, how are you? Like, you know, so um, definitely it took me the first couple weeks to just even warm up to people. Yeah, it means a lot because um, kind of with my job, I'm always, I'm seeing people. So then I, I'm always having those, hey, the weather conversations. Um, so it's, it's nice to actually be like, no, like legit, what's going on in your life? Is the friendships. Um, I, I don't think I can recall a significant, like one moment of like, this is why it was life group. It was more just all those little moments adding up. It, it definitely felt like a great honor just to be invited into someone's life because um, I know for me personally, it takes me a while to open up and just let my walls down. So to have someone be like, no, like, cause I know how much for me, how much trust it is to let someone in and have a say in what's going on when I'm in a tough time. For me actually was reading the Bible. 
Um, being a long-term Christian, I haven't been reading it safely as I should, which is not good. But being in life group had that accountability of like, hey, no, like, did you read it this week? Because I read it. <laughs> That's new for me since I came to New Hope. Um, I've never really had someone being like, okay, we're gonna be accountable. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, so <laughs> the way we kind of do it in our group is just like, hey, spill your guts, what's going on? Here's kind of the topics to maybe hit. Um, just kind of key points of, you know, what's going on in life. And then so everyone gets their turn and it's cool because you can just see, hey, what's actually going on in your life. For me, it's actually the speaking part was the scariest part. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I have to talk in front of people. I might be judged here. Like, am I okay with that? Um, but at the same time, like, you can't, you gotta, you know, take some risks in order to get some reward too, right? Again, like I said before, like seeing that piece of where can I help you? And how, like, you can help me, but how can I help you too? Um, I know I said this before, but like, if, feels like a great honor just being let in and being like hey like we knocked on the door and and you let us in like I so kick us out anytime but <laughs> but I'm just glad that you let me share or let me share in what you're going through I think for me be raising the roof because you know praise to God and like we're having a good time <laughs> <so>. <laughs> I would say go for it. Speaking as an introvert, uh, take a step into the deep end and give it more than one week too. Like give it a couple weeks. Um, you can't get to know someone like within an hour, right? It's definitely worth it. If I miss a week of life group, which I think was like maybe once, it's, it was a hard week like to go without that connection and just that, that sense of community. I definitely have seen great things come from it and just, getting to know just new hope in the church through these amazing people in my group. Yeah, coming to new hope, honestly. <laughs> Cause like, I, I feel a part of the church. Like, that's what's so great for me is like, hey, like, no, people actually want to connect with me. Like, I'm not just kind of an afterthought or, oh, how is that person? I don't remember. Oh, it's been too long. Like. So just having people being like, no, hey, how you doing? Like, haven't seen you in a while. What's going on? Life groups in general are just a great way to get to know people and just get connected to the church. So go life groups. <laughs> <laughs>
not enough unless you come will you meet me here again cause all I want is all you Unless you come, will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team, for the Ness. You can thank them. And uh, thank you for joining us. For those of you who are here and for uh, those checking us out online, we hope this service is a blessing and an encouragement to you. In a season that we all, where we all desperately need blessings and encouragement, we hope it met you where you're at. Pastor Tom, thanks for the word, that, you know, the stories and the vulnerability of sharing. Um, and we want to thank our other leaders for uh, uh, sharing those stories as well. well the, you heard it, right? Christians, Christ, Christ followers, Christ likeness, we run toward those in trouble. We run towards the crisis. We don't run from it. We don't live in a spirit of fear, but in a spirit of boldness and courageousness because we are doing exactly what God did for us. <laughs> he ran towards our trouble. And if you're a Christian, you've experienced that. You've experienced God meeting you in the mess. And that's where we experience healing. And that was the beauty of Jeff's story is that when he finally surrendered and had to, <laughs> God, God put that in his way. He was able to find healing in that, his surrender. And I encourage you as well, if you're checking us out and asking God, what does that look like? He will meet you where you are at. If you don't know much about this Jesus guy, I encourage you to check it out. He will meet you where you are at. And the uh, easiest way to do that is to fill out the connect card and just let us pray for you, share with you, encourage you. Maybe you're wondering about that 911 plan or the seven steps. We can easily explain that further. Or, of course, as you saw on the screen there, you can click on the, the YouTube channel and check out our 911 plan and seven steps there as well. Well, listen, we should be excited because we are going to one last outdoor service on October 10th. All together, the whole church family. And we will, if it's cold, we'll bundle up. We're Canadian. We all have flannel. Don't act like you don't. Uh, we'll be outside for that one service on October 10th. It's going to be amazing. You're going to want to look out for that one. Uh, Pastor Jane mentioned, and PT said a couple times in the sermon there, Life Group launch it was last week, but you haven't missed it. If you're here now or checking us out and you're like, dang, next year. No, not next year. Today, you can still join a Life Group. So make sure if you're interested in that, fill out Connect card. Pastor Jay is going to reach out for you, uh, to you and make sure you get plugged into one of those that are actually launching, I think, in the next week as well. Um, we are hoping to update some of our info. We sent a couple wellness and care packages to people's houses and they didn't let us know they moved. So some other people in Welland were very blessed by the meal train that we set up for them. Um, but if you, if you have given us your contact info, could I, you do me a huge favor? On the screen right now, there is a barcode down in the corner here. If you actually pause this and open your phone and just go over that, it'll open a page and you can update your info for us. J j just so we can uh, encourage you and make sure every email or anything we send out to love on you and encourage you goes to the right place. And if you're here uh, today, it's on the seat in front of you. You can scan that QR code or, of course, you can stop by and fill out a Connect card and we can get that info that way. We just want to make sure we're doing our best job to love you in this season and to connect with you that way. Well, God, we just thank you for the blessing it is to know that you are that kind of friend that doesn't leave us or forsake us. And we're sorry, even as Pastor Tom shared there, that we, we call up all of our other friends. In fact, we even look for the fake ones on social media. And you're right there asking us to engage with you. And we just sang a song saying that asking you to meet us here again. Thank you, God, that you're God that weeps with us in the sting of death and sin. And you actually did something about it. And you don't leave us or forsake us, but you are with us. You are always near. So God, meet us here again today as we go. And would we go with you this week, make us the blessing to the people we meet. Bring, may, may we bring you to all who we meet this week. 
We ask in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. See you next week. Amen.